Hello and welcome to this special episode of the Oncology Podcast, proudly produced by oncologynews.com.au. Today we're talking about why not all prostate cancers are the same. I'm here with Professor Damien Bolton, a researcher and neurologist from the Olivia Newton-John Cancer Centre and the University of Melbourne. Damien has performed over a thousand robot-assisted radical prostatectomies. And we are joined by Chris McNamara, Head of Community Services at the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia. As always, you'll find links to all of the papers discussed today in the notes on our website. I would also like to thank Janssen Selag PTY Limited for sponsoring this episode. You can learn more at www.janssen.com forward slash Australia. This is Rachel Babin and this is the Oncology Podcast. Hi, Damien. Hi, Chris. Thanks so much for joining me today. Afternoon, Rachel. Thank you very much for having us. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. So we're going to talk about prostate cancer today, but it is a huge subject area, as we know. So we're really narrowing our focus to the way men with advanced prostate cancer feel. I'd like to begin by mentioning research into the outcomes of treatments for prostate cancer and highlighting work you both recently contributed to. We've taken the title for today's episode from research published in the British Journal of Urology International last year, which Damien was lead author of. This paper found a marked difference in the way men with advanced prostate cancer feel and the emotions they experience, as well as important information gaps that may impact on their ability to make shared decisions about their clinical management. In parallel, the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia also recently published the results of their four-round iterative policy, Delphi, which provide guidance for policymakers, clinicians, community and consumers, and which have informed the development of their Prostate Cancer Survivorship Essentials Framework. We'll ask Chris about this in more detail. Thank you to you both again. We're very pleased to have you here on the Oncology Podcast to talk to these papers. And congratulations. We can all agree what important work this is. I'd like to start by asking Damien what the not all prostate cancer is the same research showed about how Australian men's emotional state changes as their disease progresses and why these findings should be an area of interest to the wider clinical care team. Thank you very much, Rachel. So this research was unusual in that rather than focusing on what we would normally term quantitative type research where we look at how we can improve outcomes and the exact survival benefits, the likelihood of biochemically absent disease in the way that we would traditionally in an academic sense look at cancer outcomes. What we undertook here was qualitative research where we looked at the perceptions and more subjective nature of patients' outcomes from prostate cancer diagnosis with particular reference to those men who had advanced prostate cancer. And as you mentioned, One of the key things we identified was that patients' state of mind, their impressions and their key concerns varied substantially from early stage disease through to this more advanced disease. And particularly in advanced disease, men were obviously very concerned and felt frustrated and very anxious that there was no specific cure that was going to uh, take away this problem definitively. And there was an acceptance that this was going to be a chronic issue that men would need to deal with over the remainder of their life. And in subsequent interviews and subsequent questioning, this identified itself in multiple ways depending upon the man concerned. Often men felt restricted in that they wouldn't be able to be as physically active as they might have been, that they wouldn't be able to travel without the limitation that they might have had. And they managed to deal with these perceptions quite satisfactorily for the most part. But there were a significant number of men that felt overwhelmed with the concept of having to live with prostate cancer rather than being cured of it. And this had a significant impact on their quality of life and their ability to undertake their normal activities. And indeed, there were significant gaps in knowledge were identified for patients, even in spite of all of the effort that we've gone to in the past to try and provide for appropriate information guidelines and ability for men to understand and resource information with regard to prostate cancer. Yes, I think those gaps that you've identified in that knowledge base is really crucial, isn't it? Why specifically do you think that's so important? Well, I think in the past we've focused on 
methods by which prostate cancer can be diagnosed. And indeed, men did have a very good understanding for the most part of the role of PSA, prostate biopsy and the like in helping identify prostate cancer and help with the diagnosis of this condition. But what I think we identified that they lacked was a knowledge of how disease progression ensued and how this might impact them in the future. In particular, I think what men lacked was an identification of the symptoms that might accompany that, the rate of which disease progression might ensue, the rate at which one treatment might need to be supplemented by other treatments. And indeed, these benchmarks do differ from patient to patient. We have, even within the subgroup of men with advanced prostate cancer, there are some who've got particularly aggressive disease and some with very slowly progressive disease. But we've probably not been paying attention to providing the degree of information for this group of men as we might have done for those men with organ-confined disease. Mm, Thank you. Do you believe these factors impact a patient's ability to participate in shared decision-making about their care? Without a doubt, Rachel. And indeed, one of the aspects of this study that we identified was that men relied greatly and trusted significantly their healthcare providers for support and advice in prostate cancer. Healthcare providers were routinely noted by the patients to be the most important source of support in managing prostate cancer, more important even than family members or local supportive agencies that might be easily accessed by the patients. And indeed, this degree of trust in healthcare providers differed across the wide range of men that were sampled. In fact, it differed from country to country, differed from subgroup to subgroup. A patient's ability to participate in that shared decision making is clearly really crucial to their treatment journey. Chris, I'd like to bring you in here now, if I can. From your perspective, why is enhancing patient clinician communication so important for men with advanced prostate cancer? Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Look, great question. Uh, enhancing communication is key to ensuring that men and their partners understand the options and the likely outcomes. You know, for example, what to expect after their treatment commences whether there'll be side effects and how this might impact on their daily life. So drawing on the expertise of your healthcare team can help to answer those questions that are important to you personally. Wonderful. Thank you. What do you think the elements are that need to come together for this all to be realised? Ideal world, perhaps. Look, in an ideal world, collaboration is key to success. PCFA have adopted the survivorship focus that's consumer-centred. So we actively engage men and their partners and family members in designing approaches that are proven to be effective, engaging with industry and government and raising those public awareness is also incredibly important. If we've learned anything over the years, it's that we can overcome almost any obstacle when we work together and listen to what men are telling us. Fantastic. Thank you. I think this is a good time now to talk about survivorship. For the broader audience, Chris, perhaps you could tell us what survivorship care is and what the survivorship challenges that Australian men with advanced prostate cancer typically face. Yeah, so prostate cancer survivorship care encompasses the health and well-being of men from the point of diagnosis onwards. Quality survivorship care recognises that physical, psychological, spiritual economical impacts of cancer, which can be long lasting and address those so that the man and his loved ones can achieve optimal quality of life. The recent publication in the British Journal of of Urology International by Professor Dunn took a look at the issues faced by men in prostate cancer survivorship and created a prostate cancer survivorship essentials framework and essentially a guidelines for practitioners. So the objective of that paper was to develop contemporary and inclusive prostate cancer survivorship guidelines for the Australian setting. And there were six descriptors that emerged and can possibly agree that they're all barriers within most cancer experiences. And they really include things like dealing with the side effects, it all being a bit too challenging for the individual, too much medical focus within the education given, there's uncoordinated journeys, and a lot of around the unmet needs and mental health around anxiety as well. So 26 survivorship elements were also identified into six domains. And Essentially, those barriers sit within here as well with we need to make a difference with the health promotion and advocacy, which is central to the early detection of prostate cancer and survivorship care after diagnosis and treatment by raising that community awareness and maintaining a public focus on men's health. Shared management between those patients and health professionals. So facilitating shared decision-making is really important around testing and treatment 
as well as addressing that physical and psychosocial effects, the comorbidities, the advanced cancer symptoms, and that palliative care priority. Vigilance in relation to clinical surveillance of the patients across that survivorship continuum is also necessary with attentive surveillance of physical and psychosocial effects. That personal agency is really important to patients' ability to understand the risk factors and take steps to promote personal well-being. Personal agency meaning the capacity of an individual to intake, execute and manage their actions in response to the awareness and ownership of health-related needs as well. Care coordination is required to get that patient and the families in the right place at the right time for the right care uh, once a diagnosis has been made and maintaining a focus on delivering that person-centred care in developing plans to meet the individual patients is essential for the healthcare teams. And evidence-based survivorship interventions are essential in ensuring patients receive the best possible support for their health and well-being. So these six domains really amplify the needs that are associated with prostate cancer survivorship. And each of these domains intersects and articulates with each other. And this mirrors both the patient experience and how the service operate at their best. Thank you, Chris. There's a lot of different elements involved in this. I'd like to move on now to what can be done practically to help alleviate some of these stresses for patients. Damien, what role can the clinical care team play in helping to address some of these issues for men, particularly men with advanced prostate cancer? Really, they should play the key role here, Rachel. And it's hard to overstate the significance of the concept of survivorship, as Chris was just mentioning before. Whilst many patients in our study had a very good knowledge of how PSA was linked to disease progression, there was a huge amount of unmet need for greater information and support when it came to less objective and less specific aspects of their survivorship journey. So for sake of example, the clinical team can provide more knowledge about symptoms, what doctor might be more specifically able to resolve any specific issue, realising that it's not always going to be the radiation oncologist or the urologist who's best placed to resolve any specific issue. The amount of emotional support that a patient will need will vary. And indeed, the amount of information provided will vary. And that information will need to be often provided in a different manner that's culturally sensitive and sensitive to the geography of the patient or other issues that they're dealing with in life. But all of these aspects of support from the clinical team, whether they're information-based or based on seeing the doctor or other member of the teams directly enable the patient to take control of their condition. And this was a recurrent theme of our research, that patients wanted to have more information about their disease that would help them discuss their options, that they would understand these options better, and that would enable them to feel like that they had input and buy-in to the management of their advanced prostate cancer. Fantastic. Thank you, Damien. I think it's very interesting talking about this information as well and different ways we can get this information across to different cohorts of patients as well. Chris mentioned earlier before we started recording about how some of the guys that he's been working with, you know, they prefer to receive their information online or on videos. We now have lots of new podcasts coming out for clinicians and the healthcare professionals, but the patients as well. So it's a great opportunity to get information out there, but it has to be trusted sources and It's a challenge, but I think technology could perhaps play a part there. Well, there's no doubt, Rachel, we live in a digital age now, and the ability to communicate in a convenient and rapid fashion with your clinician or the office of the clinician or the other members of the support staff is essential. And I think the days are gone, really, where people accepted the views of the doctor or whoever was treating them without questioning them and without giving that any thought. And that's only appropriate now that people consider the treatment they're being provided, whether it's in the sense of what's going to provide them with the best chance of a cure, the best quality of life afterwards. And as Chris mentioned earlier on, the economic impact and the side effect impact of treatment. Yes, there's a a lot of ongoing impacts beyond the initial treatment diagnosis and the treatment journey. Chris, I'd like to know your thoughts on this as well. How can the clinical care team better support men with advanced prostate cancer through provision, particularly of holistic support? So these things that we're talking about, you know, there's the 
physical needs, but the psychosocial, the spiritual, the economic needs as well. Yeah, look, one of the greatest tools I ever used during my clinical experience was the prostate cancer distress screening tool. So if we don't know what the problems are and we don't know what the individual essentially finds as being unmet needs for them or distress for them, then we don't know how to actively act and refer on to members of that MDT or the multidisciplinary team. So this tool was used by every member of my MDT at every point of contact with the patient. So it's a self-evaluated form which allows the healthcare team to address an individual's direct needs and act on them with timely appropriate referral to services that they require, including all of those that were mentioned and, and exercise, physical activity, mental and sexual health, and dealing with the side effects and more. Heightened distress occurs across all treatment approaches, but the distress levels are greater for men with locally advanced and metastatic disease. And of course, psychological distress is, is generally higher around that diagnosis, but that distress can persist over a longer period of time. Uh, so it's essential for healthcare practitioners to look after a man and carry out screening of that man at every point of contact. And this will allow for that referral to timely and appropriate members of the MDT, therefore assisting in reducing the negative outcomes along the way in that particular man's prostate cancer experience. Mm. Thank you, Chris. That's a very uh, interesting points there. And I think what you mentioned before about location and distance also is an important factor here. Perhaps you'd like to talk to that a little bit. Yeah. So as we were talking about previous to the recording today, is that there is that difference when it comes to someone who has the full access to services in a metropolitan centre and has essentially all those members of the MDT at their fingertips. But what do we do for those guys that come for treatment and then disappear back to rural remote areas and don't have that access to services? If, you know, the coronavirus situation proved anything to us last year is that that people are a a lot more willing to engage in telehealth services. So we have noticed an engagement through the telehealth services in the previous 12 months, as well as that need or want for the digital resources and information. So as we're just talking about before, the men liking resources in different avenues, whether they're podcasts or downloadable material or or, um, videos on YouTube, you know, we've seen a lot more engagement in the last sort of 12 months for those sorts of platforms than we have for the years previous. So the changing demographic of patient, I guess, is a lot more connected these days. And we've got to make sure that, that we do accommodate for all of those different avenues when assessing a patient for where they're coming from. Thank you, Chris. You've been Head of Community Services at the PCFA for about 12 months, so it would be remiss of me not to ask you what your key priorities are for the next 12 months, um, particularly what we can do to improve outcomes for men affected by advanced prostate cancer. Oh, look, where do I start, Rachel? I'd, I'd like to see 2021 being a year that we at PCFA can continue to reduce the burden of prostate cancer for all Australians, uh, mobilising the community to drive research, uh, prevention and early detection, improve treatment and world-class psychosocial care. And, and this includes advocacy priorities such as reviewing the NHMRC endorsed PSA test guidelines, action to support the approval of new medicines and treatments, public health awareness activity on prostate cancer risks and family history via our Stargate projects. And this aims to improve prostate cancer awareness by providing Australian communities with fact sheets on the burden of disease at a regional level nationwide. This suite of resources will include about 89 fact sheets of different regional areas to help improve community understanding and save lives and enhancing support for men with high risk forms of prostate cancer, including advocacy for new prostate cancer research and treatment. Now, service priorities in 2021 would include things like expansion of the prostate cancer specialist nurse service and launch of a a new prostate cancer telenursing uh, service. And this is pretty exciting because this, as we were talking about before, access to members of the MDT will close that gap for rural remote communities to be able to access specialist nursing support and resources as well, no matter where they are in the country. Growth of our support group network, our ambassadors program and associated peer support initiatives, engagement in community in our work through our campaigns. We had some very successful campaigns last year, driving the community with the long run and our big Aussie barbecues as well. I'd also like to see that strengthening of community outreach through the distribution of evidence-based information, our magazine, the Blue Sky News and our other media outlets as well. 
Fantastic. Thanks, Chris. Well, hopefully you can tick some of those off your list in the next 12 months. Damien, do you have a key take home message that you would like to share? I think particularly, you know, a lot of clinicians listen to the oncology podcast. So I think your take home message would be valuable at this point. I think with respect to the manuscript that we had published in particular, I would just make the point that there's no easy, simple one aspect of treatment fixes all problems for every patient. If you can imagine, there was a phenomenal variety of unmet needs for patients who had advanced prostate cancer that we unearthed. The main thing would be, though, that most of the men who were interviewed as a component of this study seemed to identify that what they wanted was information from reputable sources. So whether that be Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia, Cancer Council websites, I often in my own clinical practice refer people to the website of the University of California where I worked, which has good patient-directed results. But people want information that is from a credible website. People are very good, and we don't give them credit, I think, for identifying that they're often being given mixed messages from the websites that offer a very simple cure for all of their problems. And I would uh, encourage any patient to think deeply about what they're reading, understand if they're maybe some financial implication for what they're reading, understand more deeply whether there's secondary gain for the person providing the information. And of course, there is no better resource than continuing to discuss your problem with other supportive care agencies, with other clinicians to get a second opinion and to read widely, whether it's from printed media or on the internet about the condition that you have. Yes, information is power. We'll be sure to include links to all those resources. So what about the future, Damien? What are you working on this year? Genetics of prostate cancer and what your risk of prostate cancer is if you've got a family history of it. That's our NHMRC grant that looks at this. And um, I could bang on for hours about this, but I think it's the most understated thing in urology at the moment. Do you know that other than age, the biggest single factor that determines your outcome from prostate cancer is your family history of it? There was a huge spike in prostate cancer diagnosis related to Angelina Jolie. Once people know about the impact of genes on prostate cancer, everyone wins. It's something that we associate so much with breast cancer and ovarian cancer, but yeah, that's fair. So here's the interesting thing, right? If someone's born with the genes to be tall, That'll Mm. affect both women and men. If you've got the genes to be smart, you'll be smart if you're a male or a female. If you've got the genes to have, I don't know, be left-handed, you'll be left-handed if you're a male or a female. So now you've got this key group of genes that predispose you to cancers related to the reproductive system. Do you reckon they only work in women? That is very sobering. Uh, Topic worthy of a whole other podcast, I think. So uh, please keep us posted on that work. Please. Great, Rachel. And Chris, what about you? You were a specialist nurse before you became head of community services at the PCFA. So I'm sure you must have some great resources you'd like to recommend. Do you have any top tips to help men going through their treatment journeys? Perhaps some strategies to help them to feel more in control? Yeah, thanks, Rachel. I think, well, Here's a specialist nurse coming out of me. Look, there's there's plenty of strategies that a man can use to help make decisions. They're very simple, but they're powerful and often forgotten in the heat of the moment. So it's things like taking your time, writing down questions, two sets of ears are always better than one, and seeking that credible information, as Damien was just talking about. So the PCFA resources, there's plenty of places out there that have got resources, but at the moment, the PCFA resources and the prostate cancer specialist nurse programs are always a good way to start and also making sure that you're breaking down that decision and and really taking all of your questions to your consultant, to your healthcare team, and really talking through and weighing up the pros and cons. You can talk to others. There's plenty of peer support, support group networks, and the PCFA online community is also a really great resource hub for, for peer support and guided resources as well. But look, there are various ways that men like to receive resources these days. And I really recommend checking out that resources tab on the website, on the PCFA website. Uh, We find evidence-based resources to assess men and their partners. So uh, they're available in hard copies, downloads, and hopefully soon to be podcasts and videos as well. So there's kind of a different avenue for wherever that man wants to get the information. From a healthcare practitioner's point of view, though, there's also monographs, flip charts, and guidelines 
in prostate cancer, including the frameworks for practice, some psychosocial care and economic modelling of healthcare, and hopefully the revamped PSA guidelines, some Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander type resources are available there as well. So it's a really good point of call for resources. Yes, it's important to have resources that are tailored to different patient groups as well. Damien, was there something that you wanted to add in on this? Yeah, if there's one thing we learned from this study, Rachel, which was a multinational study, it's how fortunate we are in Australia to have the healthcare system we do have. I don't think that any system is perfect, but there's no limit to the number of resources that are put there by whether it be public hospitals, private hospitals, individual practitioners, agencies that are charitable or supportive in their nature. And I just encourage any patient who had concerns about their condition, how they were managing it, the type of support they needed, or the lack of information that they felt that they had received to any particular point, that there is much more in the way of information available than is apparent at first glance. I'd encourage anyone to read widely and research widely on this and to get another opinion from another urologist, radiation oncologist, oncologist, or whoever they're dealing with. Thank you, Damien. Yes, I think we're very lucky in Australia. We really are. Something that really stood out to me reading your paper was the experience of Japanese men and how different that was and that we would regard Japan as a similar, you know, socioeconomic country to Australia, but their experiences were quite different. Yeah, well, prostate cancer, as was suggested by the title of the manuscript, was presented in a multitude of different ways and meant so many different things to different people depending on where you were. But the one thing that it did mean to men in Australia was if it was identified early, it was able to be controlled and even where it had advanced that multiple treatments were available to them. Fantastic. Well, thank you both for taking the time to explore this with me. And I think we've unpacked why not all prostate cancer is the same. So thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. Pleasure, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you once again to Janssen Australia for sponsoring this podcast. This episode of the Oncology Podcast is proudly produced by Oncology News Australia and sponsored by Janssen, the pharmaceutical companies of Johnson & Johnson. Learn more at www.janssen.com forward slash Australia. For regular oncology news and podcast updates, subscribe to the Oncology Newsletter for free on oncologynews.com.au. Thanks for listening. This is Rachel Babin and this is the Oncology Podcast.